All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Self Batile is ten intercession at Green Valley College. Day of exam Monday. Um, don't forget there are some assessments closing tonight. Homework is one of it, I think, and also discussion. Um, I will uh, extend the discussion to another day. Um, so instead of a closing tonight, the two discussions, the one-on-one and the discussion on astronomy and astrology, I will close tomorrow night and I will explain why. I was going to read some of the posts today in the morning and and put a reply so you, you would have a chance to improve grades. But I didn't have a chance to do that. I, I got trapped with some other um, school uh, job and, and then I had to leave to proctor the exam and then I got involved with some other things regarding uh, the physics department and I couldn't do it. And I will not do it tonight, um, but I will do it tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning, which is Tuesday, uh, you will read the discussions that are, were supposed to be closed tonight. And I will post comments so you still have a chance to improve grade if you want. And then by midnight tomorrow, it, it's closed. The other thing I would like to announce, as I always do in my online class, I open the midterm twice and, and I pick up the high score of both attempts. And the reason is uh, usually um, there are problems. I had all kinds of problems with the students completing midterm. Sometimes they miss. Alert from. Oops, sorry. Update Apple ID oh, settings. You'll be quiet. Sorry about that. Um, sometimes uh, I had students that had the car breaking down when they are going home to do the exam one hour before midnight. So all of this happened. Until then, on Wednesday, I will open again, and then you have a chance to redo it. But I will not be proctoring face-to-face -face, uh, because I can't, I can't go to Evergreen and, and do that. So you have to do using uh, Proctorio. So you have to get a computer, have to get the Google Chrome extension. Uh, but if, if you can't get a hold of one computer with the Google Chrome extension, uh, just let me know and I can see if Evergreen can proctor that for you with, in, in the tutoring center. But I don't think that will be a problem, okay? All right, so uh, chapter, we are not going over now chapter five or six, going sequence, right? So we are jumping a little bit in the book and uh, we are pretty much initiating chapter 14, causing samples, the origin of the solar system. So we know we live on a planet Earth and we know there are sky motions we are uh, able to observe, the diurnal motion, which is Earth rotating on its spin on its axis of rotation. There is also Earth revolution around the Sun that gives rise to um, the different constellations in the sky in different months and also the seasons. And, and there is a third one that is very much relevant to the subject of astrology and astronomy we are trying to discuss, and that is precession. And in fact, I would like to give some um, explanation of these two discussions we have been doing one one week uh, tomorrow. So not tomorrow. Yeah, to, no, uh, on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I will take probably 10 minutes of these uh, office hours and talk about precession, which is an interesting subject, and also uh, this uh, discussion we are doing on astronomy and astrology. But basically, how solar system, how stars in general are formed, Here's the, this picture here gives a good example. And let me show you an animation before we go there. This is a star called X, EX Lupi. Uh, EX Lupi is a star that is a little bit uh, cooler than the sun. And 
and this is an animation, right? It's not a real thing. It's an animation. It's a rendering, artist rendering of what uh, happened with this star. But what you're going to see is you have this star in a phase of pre-main sequence star or pre-star formation. We are going to study uh, these terms in, a, in, in next week. But basically, um, the central, central star is surrounded by a circumstellar disk this disk that is depicted here in red. And what we learned in the last 10 or 20 years is that uh, in the very beginning of star formation, the disk doesn't go straight towards the star, but is disrupted by this stellar magnetic field that drags this disk and takes material towards high latitude regions in the star. So this animation show more or less what is the process of star formation. You have to have cold gas uh, in the interstellar medium and then gravity does the trick. Gravity takes this cold gas and brings it to a center part uh, in which fu a future star will be formed. But not only that, um, this gas initially is subject to a rotation. It has some initial spin, and as this is, oh, sorry, uh, let's go back here. As this initial spin uh, takes care, so this is the first part in, in the process of star formation. You have to, to identify places in the galaxy where you can find cold gas. Uh, if the gas is hot, Gravity is not efficient to bring the gas to a center of mass where the star will be formed. Um, hot gas has a tendency to expand. Cold gas has a tendency to contract and to create silicates and dust and grains. Um, this is basically what happened in the first step of star formation. Um, you, you, you have to have cold gas of a certain density, of a certain uh, mass, so that gravity can efficiently initiate the process of contraction. And that is what, what is being represented here by these white arrows. But because the gas, gas itself has some initial rotation, and astronomers call that angular momentum, because the gas, the original gas, has some rotation, like if you observe rivers, as the river flow, and if you are standing on shore, just observing the river passing by, um, the water goes globally in one direction. But here and there, you can see some vortexes, um, some um, spinning uh, part of this uh, river, and kind of you could think some similar process happen in the interstellar medium where cold gas exists. So we have this cold gas globally going around the galactic center, but here and there there is interactions and that interaction leads to vortex or to rotation. The gas is not stationary in itself. It has some rotation, preferential rotation, as a result of interaction with other clouds. Um, so this rotation associated with contraction gives rise to this flattened disk you can see in the step number two. So again, when we talk about star formation, we are talking about a process by which gravity takes gas and brings N to a center. But also, you have to add rotation to the mix, and rotation will create this circumstellar material, this disk of matter with a concentration of gas near the center. But out of this circumstellar disk, which is shown in the slide number three, then uh, a lot of uh, uh, planetary objects will be formed. And which planetary objects are we talking about? So we are talking about planets, we are talking about their satellites, their moons, uh, we are talking about rock-type objects like asteroids, comets. So take note of these terms, you must uh, master them in this section. And that is going to be in your midterm number two. So we have to know exactly how asteroids so, and where asteroids are located, where comets are located, and what are the two major types of comets. 
and why comets are the way they are, and why comets are uh, chemically different from asteroids. So asteroids are kind of a rocky type of um, uh, planetary objects, whereas comets are kind of a dirty balls of ice. Ice, not necessarily water ice, but ice of water, methane, um, ammonia, all, all kind of volatiles that indicate comets being formed further out in, in the solar system, not close to the sun. And then eventually you ended up in slide number four with a central hot star surrounded by a chunk of objects. Now, since the star is hot, don't expect to find ices close to the star. So ices will condense, will crystallize in regions further out. In regions, for instance, where Jupiter is located, where Saturn is located, where the giant planets are located. And in regions closer to the Sun, um, you are prone to find uh, rock-type objects and metal-type of objects of high metallicity, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Moon, the asteroids. Now, the asteroids happen to exist in the zone between Mars and Jupiter. And then Jupiter and beyond, you are talking about um, a certain uh, locale of our solar system further out of the Sun, where uh, the condensation of ices uh, more efficiently formed um, this volatile type of objects in, in, in e regions even, even further out, further away from uh, Neptune, then there is a, another a region called o, uh, uh, Kuiper Belt where uh, cometary type of objects happen to be located. Now, uh, here's the Sun. Of course, don't, don't take this uh, in scale at all. Um, Mercury here appears to be the same size of Earth and same size of Mars, and Jupiter seems the same, same size of Earth. So they are not the same size, right? Jupiter is 10 times as big as Earth, and Earth is 100 times smaller than the Sun. So this is not in scale. Also, which is not in scale is the distance of these objects. They are pretty much further out. But putting all of them together in this picture gives you a nice idea of how the Sun itself helped to constrain and to determine the characteristics or the chemical characteristics of objects in the solar system. And quite often, as we learn more and more astronomy, we are going to find that the center part of a system in general controls the dynamics and also the characteristics of the entire system. Here, the Sun is the controller because of its heat. The Sun is hot. None of these uh, planetary objects have proper lights. And so um, when you look at Mercury, you'll find Mercury in a region where the temperature 1500 Kelvin, Kelvin is a scale of temperature, is a, uh, Mercury is located in a region where this type of metal can easily be formed at that temperature out of the material uh, of that cloud that I was showing previously. See this cloud over here? This cloud over here eventually coalesce and condense and crystallize into dust and grains. And so the dust and grains that are formed closer to the sun can be so made of metal oxides and iron nickel alloy. Nickel alloy. So you don't need to memorize these names, but you need to kind of have a sense that planets that are closer to the sun, they tend to be more metal rich than planets that are further out. And as you move it away to the region where Venus are, different types of metals and different types of minerals uh, happen to be formed. Um, one of the things we learn if you study geology is that um, if you go to Earth interior, uh, there are different temperature zones in the Earth interior, and in each one of them a different family of minerals will be formed. So minerals are like living organisms. They are not alive, right? They don't reproduce. They don't have fun, you know, doing baby minerals. Um, they, they are pretty much uh, inorganic materials. 
But mineral, uh, crystals and minerals are interesting because they are formed under certain uh, boundaries and regions of temperature and pressure. So if you take a mineral like olivine or feldspar that is formed uh, deep inside Earth and you bring them to our surface, they will not be happy, if you will, up here because the temperature, uh, the, the water conditions, the acidity and everything else, it's, it's, it's going to start rotten and decay these minerals and they will change into something else that can be more stable in this environment. And I mean, uh, they, can, they transform themselves into silica, silica um, in clay minerals and some uh, other type of minerals that can they, 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 they can thrive, they can survive up here on, on Earth crust. So same thing in the solar system. If you think about a certain distance from the sun, you have a certain temperature and the conditions will be just right for certain types of minerals to be formed. And so the planets that happen to be formed out of the material in that zone will be richer and will be more metal or less metal abundant, depend on where the planet itself happened to be formed. Um, look at this. As you go to the regions where Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptunes are formed, now you don't see that much the production uh, or the conditions for a metal oxide. This too can be formed, um, but you might be more um, efficiently in finding uh, water, ammonia, and methane because of the, the, the concentration of volatiles in these regions. In other words, if you take a scoop of a material taken from, let's say, mercury, that scoop of material that represents the average of what mercury is, is going to be entirely different from a scoop of material that you take out of, let's say, Jupiter. Jupiter is going to be more uh, richer in hydrogen and helium than, uh, for instance, Mercury itself. So, in this section in particular, uh, 14.3, formation of solar system. So, take a reading on it. And the key concepts are given, again, uh, the word accretion is important. So what accretion is? Accretion is a word that is used when solid, uh, when the material is driven into some center or when there is a process by, by which accumulation of material happens in some seed. So uh, where can you hear the word accretion? You might hear the word accretion in association with, for instance, the formation of a snowflake. Snowflake. So a snowflake, you have some seed up in, in, in the atmosphere, and, and then ice crystals are formed in the seed. And, and then by static forces, um, more uh, of these flakes get to be uh, uh, brought together, stick together, and so this flake just keep on growing, and eventually we see it falling. So when you see this falling snowflake, um, there is an accretion process that led to the growth of that flake from microscopical size to bigger size. And the electrostatic forces were responsible for gluing uh, these flakes. That's one example. Now, in, in the realm of uh, star formation or planet formation, Accretion is a process by which not elect electric forces, by gravity, but gravity forces uh, bring material into the center of mass uh, and therefore allowing the mass of the center object to grow. And we call that process accretion. Accretion is gas falling. In the case of star formation or planetary formation, is material falling onto the center part. In the case of our Sun, um, this process of accretion out of this circumstellar gas, it, it, it took a good 20 million years. 
20 million years, not a billion years. The universe is 13.7 billion years. But in 20 million years, um, out of a protoplanet, uh, I'm sorry, out of a, a protostar to the point of a, a star almost ready to be formed, we are talking about uh, a time scale of about 20, 20 million years. Now, uh, meteors, meteorites, and and so what are they? So meteors are any objects that happen to meteoroids are objects that happen to be existing in our solar system, and they are free flowing and going around uh, the sun as most of everything else in the solar system. They have to be small, they might be leftovers, they are not part of any planet or any moon, but they are there, they are orbiting and sometimes asteroids collide and they create more uh, rubbish and more uh, group of meteoroids out there in the solar system. Now sometimes some of them happen to be uh, attracted by Earth and they fall in our atmosphere. And if this happened during night time, we see this as a tracing, um, like a ball of uh, fire. Oh, um, sometimes you might heard the term shooting stars or meteor showers. Um, and I discussed this ter term before, meteor showers, which happens when Earth uh, moves into uh, the trail left by uh, comets. As comets go close to the sun, get near the sun, they vaporize some of their coma, and together with uh, volatiles, it comes a lot of dust. And, and then when Earth goes into this dust, it falls in our atmosphere and burns out. And we call that uh, meteor showers. So a uh, shooting star is not a real star that happen to be uh, falling in our atmosphere. Remember, stars are very big. Our planet Earth is compared with the sun, which is not a big star. Um, our planet Earth, this immense planet we live, is one hundredth of the sun size. So you take the sun's diameter, you can put aligned one hundredth of our planets, just to give an idea of size. So we are small compared with a star. So a star cannot fall on Earth. It doesn't happen that way. But we call shooting star because when you look up to the sky at nighttime, you see these traces of fireball just zooming through the atmosphere and burning out. Um, and sometimes it's so, so spectacular that you can see even in twilight. And I happen to, to be able to see this happening a long time ago in Santa Cruz. Five in the afternoon was kind of a... The sun was not up anymore. It was pretty much winter. Uh, it was getting dark, but I could see this nice fireball with a trace of smoke. It was spectacular. But anyway, so meteorites is when some of these uh, shooting stars or meteor uh, hit the ground. And then when you collect it, you call that a meteorite. And then you can analyze, you can take to, to, uh, to a museum, you can sell. And there are different types of meteorites. Um, in fact, there are different types of meteor, meteors or meteoroids in, in the solar system. Some of them are stony rich, so they, they have more of the rocky type. And some of them are iron rich. So they have more of minerals, they are rich in iron, and some of them are stony iron, iron uh, type of minerals. So um, take a look, read those con contents, and, um, and, uh, and then we can talk about later. Planetary evolution. So um, asteroids, they they don't have they are not big at all. They are small in size, and and therefore they don't have this spherical shape. This spherical shape exists in objects that once 
they, they were able to get the liquid phase all over. So if the planet in any part of the, its history got completely melted, and, and this happen, happened with planet Earth and with the other terrestrial planets, gravity force which acts towards the center equally, so gravity shaped that object, that planet, like a sphere. And then eventually this sphere crystallized and then you have a solid spherical planet. But asteroids are small and they never had enough heat um, stored to melt them completely. And so they have this irregular form, as you can see. Some as uh, asteroids, they come with an atmosphere. They are, uh, they are efficiently hold on to an atmosphere. But atmosphere exists only if the planet itself has enough gravity to, to retain one. Mercury, it's small. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, Venus has a thick atmosphere primarily of carbon dioxide, as well as Earth as a thick atmosphere, not as thick as Venus, um, but it's a different atmosphere. And later on, we're going to study why our atmospheres happen to be different. And then Mars has an atmosphere that is even thinner than that of Earth. Um, and then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, do they have an atmosphere? Yes but they are primarily gas giants, or liquid giants, as I prefer to say. Now, when you go to the end of the chapter, right? So if you are reading online, like I'm doing here, right? I'm reading online. You get to the end of it, that's it, it's, it's over. But let me show you one thing. If you go to OpenStax, and you download the entire book as a PDF, when you get to the end of this chapter, you have questions. And then you can ask me questions, and you can explore. And what I'm telling you, I will take some of these questions, and I will put in midterm number two, so you can focus your learning a little bit better and not be so scattered. You still have questions that are kind of a general and that require some overall uh, knowledge of uh, what we are studying. That is true. But you also have some more uh, focus, focus type of questions in here. So, for instance, how are comets related to meteor showers? So this is a good thing for you to go back to the book and figure out why. So then you, you learn that meteor showers happen when Earth goes into the comet uh, path, past comet path. And, and, and that has debris, and when Earth goes into that debris, debris falls on Earth, and then we, we see meteor showers. So I could very well create a question based on that, and then you should be able to, to answer if you uh, had some time reviewing the subject. Uh, describe the solar nebula and, nebula and outline the sequence of events within the nebula that gave rise to the planetesimals. So um, the entire solar system, the entire system of any star is initiated when you have cold gas in the interstellar medium. And then gravity um, in certain places of these giant molecular clouds might efficiently initiate contraction. Okay. And that's one of the discussions we are doing this week in star formation. So contraction leads to uh, two things. One, the formation of a central star. Second, the formation of a circumstellar disk around the central star. Now, out of the circumstellar disk, you can determine regions closer to the star and regions further out. So, eventually, the temperature will drop to the point that uh, grains and crystals can be formed. Now, closer to the sun, what type of crystals can you expect to be formed? Well, those that are rocky types, those that are rich in iron, and, and silica, and, and oxygen, and, and, 
and, and, and, and silicates, basically. So those are the types of minerals and crystals that you expect to find, find closer to the sun because they can be formed at very high out temperature. Now, if you go away from the sun, you also can form this type of silicates because eventually the cloud temperature will drop to the point they can be formed. But because that region is further away from the sun, the drop in temperature will not stop at a certain level. We'll keep plunging down. And then eventually, crystals of ice will start to be formed. So the difference between planetesimals closer to the sun and planetesimals that are further out are primarily uh, determined and controlled by the sun's temperature. So further out is cold and then you expect to find ice. Closer to the sun is hot, so you don't expect to find ice, but you expect to find um, crystals of minerals that can be formed at high temperature. Uh, another one here, let's see. How do the planets discovered so far around all the star dif differ from those in our own solar system? At least at least two ways. Well, in the subject of exoplanet that this chapter introduced, there are two major techniques that was um, employed in the past to find exoplanets. In fact, the first techniques called the Rage of the Velocity um, technique. So the Rage of the Lost technique use what astronomers this is called Doppler effect. Doppler effect. Um, Doppler effect allows uh, is is um, I should have some uh, animation. Let's see if I can bring an animation here. I hope this is good. <laughs> oh boy, what are you guys doing? One skip ad, okay. Three minutes. Oh, that's the double effect in the Big Bang Theory. Surely. So here's a thing that is emitting waves. It could be a fire truck emitting sound, it could be a star emitting light, it could be a duck creating ripples on a pond. Those are all waves, and they all look something like this. We see the Doppler effect happening when the thing that is emitting waves moves. In the direction it's moving, the wave fronts bunch up, and behind it they spread. Okay, so see these little dots that are moving to the left hand side, and see the separation between these two wave fronts? The separation is less than it is here. So the wavelength, which means the frequency has increased in this part, and the frequency has decreased in this part. Um, the wavelength, the separation between waves, is bigger here than it is there, right? So let me keep it going. So which means um, if you are an observer in the left-hand side that is seeing this dot moving towards, you see that dot, if you think about sound, emitting a, a high pitch sound, so the frequency is higher. Whereas if you are on the right hand side seeing this dot moving away from you, you perceive that dot, if that's a sound wave, um, with a lower frequent, frequency type of sound. Now, this Doppler effect is also true with light. So, um, stars emit light. And then astronomers, when, when the star moves towards you, you detect what we call a blue shift of the light. The frequency of the light is slightly increased towards high frequency. Whereas when the star moves away from you, you detect um, a red shift of the light. So the star slightly becomes red, if you will, uh, because of red shift. Now, what if the star now is a system 
that has a planet, a giant planet, that is very much close to the star. So when, when you have a planet that rotates very much close to the star, uh, create, uh, and if you're observing the star, you're going to detect the star wobbling, uh, going blue shift and red shift, blue shift and red shift. So as you observe the star, and as the star orbit this planet, this giant, hypothetical giant planet next to the star, you detect this Doppler effect going on, and astronomers nowadays have enough precision to measure the shift and translate that into properties, not only of the star itself, but properties uh, regarding the planet itself. So the first planets ever found away from our solar system called exoplanets were found with this um, Doppler effect or radio velocity uh, technique. And in fact, uh, tomorrow, because this is such an important subject, tomorrow I will open the discussion with these two animations, one for the radio velocity uh, technique and another one for the second technique used by astronomers to um, detect planet, and that is the phot photometric technique. In that one, so you, 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 take, you take your telescope and you point at a star and, and you keep measuring uh, the star brightness with, with the strong with strong precision, with high precision, and as the planet migrate in front of the star, you detect a dimming of the starlight because now part of the star itself is being blocked by the planet. And, and if the planet is orbiting the star, you're going to see this dimming happening in a, with a certain cadence, with a certain uh, frequency. And, and then again, astronomers can use this technique to measure uh, planet properties. And again, tomorrow, I will be more specific on, on this type of technique. Oh, I shouldn't be showing this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I lost my class. No, there you go. So those are so basically one technique uses spectroscopy. That's the radio velocity. The other one uses photometry, which is uh, the one pretty much brought up by by Kepler satellite. Uh, why are some planets and moons more geologically active than others? That's a good question. So what is by the way what is geologic activity? So geologic activity is required that the planet or the moon has some internal heat source that is find its way out. For instance, planet Earth has an internal heat. Uh, the temperature in the very core of Earth is, uh, is, is high enough to put in motion, convective emotions, from the very core all the way to the surface. So Earth is still hot inside. And because of this, you have convective motions that drive uh, specifically the plate tectonics. And all this geological activity, especially us living in the Bay Area, are used to with earthquakes, um, volcanoes. If you move north, if you go north to Oregon and, and Washington and all this cascade range of volcanoes, so all of that's because Earth is geologically active, because Earth has heat inside, and that heat must find its way out. So the Moon is not geologically active because that heat is gone. It's a small planet. Perhaps Mercury is, is geologically dead because it's, it's small and the heat has, has gone, gone away. So imagine if you have a big planet, a big potato and a small potato, an Idaho potato and a little uh, red potato, right? You boil both of them in water and then you put them on, on the counter when they are completely cooked. And then what you notice is the little potato is going to be out of heat pretty soon 
and the big potato is going to be uh, radiating heat for a long time. Well, because uh, the massive and the surface area is, is bigger than the other one, and then the heat stays longer inside, but eventually goes out. But there is another source of heat on Earth, and that is radioactive decay of certain unstable atoms. So atoms, they are not stable, uh, like uranium is not stable. Um, from time to time, they decay into lighter atoms. And as they do this decay, they produce energy, they release energy. And that energy is what keeps Earth hot. Now, some satellites are geologically active, and they are small, so how can you explain that? Well, but these satellites are closer to bigger planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And um, these planets exert some um, tidal forces on them that brings energy to these satellites. So uh, pretty much a process. As the satellite goes around the planet, sometimes they are closer, sometimes they further out. The gravity is different. There is a differential gravity as they orbit the planet, and these satellites keep being squeezed and released, squeezed and released like a, like a harmonic, and, and, and that generates internal heat, internal energy, uh, leading the satellites to be active. So I would say take these questions as a guiding process. Try to find the answers in the chapters and I will have some of midterm two questions based on them. And I will make it multiple choice so you can, uh, you can focus more your learning in this chapter. Does that make sense? That's pretty much for chapter 14. And tomorrow, in the opening of uh, the other chapter, and I even don't know what it is, I have to go to the book and see it. Let me see there. Tomorrow we are be we are focusing on oh it's you chapter fourteen that's great yeah so uh, tomorrow I will bring um, the radio velocity technique and the Kepler satellite that use photometry and how that relates to um, to exoplanets and the population of thousands of exoplanets there exists out there. All right. Let me go back to the zoom now. Where is the zoom? You guys have any question? All right. Sounds good. Good night to all of you.